That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's good to see you this July 4th weekend. May God bless America and send a revival. Hope you're enjoying your weekend. I enjoyed, in, in spite of having all my family over, I still had a great time. <laughs> we had a good time, didn't we? We ate too much, had a lot of fun, praise the Lord together. Romped and stomped. I told Kathy last night my back was hurting. I said, oh, I got grandkiditis. You, know? <laughs> you ever get grandkiditis? Kind of right there between the shoulder blades. You shouldn't have picked them up or whatever it was. But it's good to see you today. I hope you have enjoyed the weekend because it's over yesterday. Sunday is the first day of the week. This is the day we give the Lord. That's why we're going to have such a great week this week because it belongs to the Lord. Uh, I started a series of messages last week called Breaking Free. There that thing is. And uh, in the series of messages, we're talking about our freedom in Christ. Now, too many people today in the church are living in far too much bondage in their life. God never, I'm hearing a resonant tone out of your keyboard system up here. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> sounds like it's stuck on a E flat. <laughs> Maybe it's just my imagination. Could be grandkiditis, I don't know, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, while they look that over and tell me if I'm crazy or not, it's fine. But we've been talking about the freedom for the believer, and too many Christians live in bondage in their spiritual life. Sometimes it's like gross sin that we would call that. Sometimes it's in those secret sins. But nonetheless, bondage is bondage, sin is sin. We shouldn't have to live in such a way that, uh, you know, we're, we're not free in our Christian walk of life. Thank you, Mr. Y'all give Mr. Pippen a big hand, would you? <laughs> So we're going to start with part two, and in dealing with part two, we're talking about a proper worldview. Uh, you know, Christians, uh, we talked about last week, many times have uh, misconceptions about spiritual warfare and spiritual things and spiritual freedom, especially in regards to the demonic world and to how Satan has an active hand in people's life and just to what level and to what extent. We talked about all those, all the misinformation and all the wrong ideas that especially in the church we hold today where we kind of relegate spiritual things to kind of out there, they're not, they're not active, when in reality the Bible says that we are in a war and there's a spiritual battle that's going on. And if we're not waging that spiritual battle, then we're losing the war. And far too often we look at the conflicts in our lives and we just r relate to them in purely a physical way instead of realizing, hey, there, there's something else in operation here. So we're discussing those kind of things today, especially about having the, the right mindset towards, towards these particular ideas that, that are out there and what is the biblical view. And we'll talk about some worldviews that are out there, Western worldview, the secular view basically, uh, in the Eastern mindset or Western mindset. And then we're going to close the message out with talking about what, what's the biblical approach to, to the spiritual realm. It's interesting as we talked last week about how the church seems to be moving away, you know, from... Uh, uh, understanding or dealing with the demonic, in fact, just questioning many times the reality of demonic influence. On the other hand, the world has charged headlong into the spiritual realm with almost with reckless abandonment. When you look at all the things that are happening in the culture from the rise of the New Age movement to the acceptance of parapsychology as a science to the growing popularity of people's interest in the supernatural, the increasing visibility of Satanism in the culture, all these things uh, tend to make us realize that although the church may be ignoring some facts, the world is looking at it in a completely different view. Uh, some people think about the New Age movement and just think about the celebrity issue, you know, but it goes well beyond the celebrity issue because the New Age movement has made significant roads not only into the entertainment world, but into the business world, the secular world, education, even religions across our nation. Uh, one of the great books that really helped me in ministering to people and as well as my own personal life was a series of books written by Dr. Neil Anderson. The last book was called The Bondage Breaker. And in, in that particular book, Dr. Neil Anderson talked about the different worldviews that, that, uh, that were prevalent in the world. He, he caught, first of all dealt with the Western worldview. And I want to look and see what he says about that today and see where we're at in regard to this. First of all, he says the Western world sees the kind of their, their, uh, their, their perspective is the world in two tiers, basically. There's the, the upper tier, which is the transcendent world. That's the ghosts, the goblins, and the ghouls, you know, that, that, that are there. And uh, it's only understood through some kind of strange religion or through mysticism at best. And then they look, the other tier of that world is the more the empirical world, where we understand it through science, 
through our physical senses. We relate to it in regard to what I can touch and taste, see, feel, hear, those kind of things. And I relate to the world around me on that level. Unfortunately, many Christians, that's all they do is relate to the world around them on that empirical world. They, they just leave off any kind of comprehension as to where they're at in their own life in regard to the spiritual world. Now, this, this is the, what you might call the two-tier mentality. With that mentality, the spiritual world, that world of the kingdom of darkness and demons, the devil, it really has no practical bearing in the natural world if that's your mindset. We've excluded it from in our understanding and from, from our reality and really even from the church. Many churches don't deal with these issues of demons and Satan, fallen world and angels and forces and rulers and powers and in high places. In fact, most attempts today and even in Christianity, when you look at Christian psychology, uh, they exclude this element of the supernatural as well. Uh, this kind of marriage between secular psychology and kind of Christianizing it in so many ways is, is, is an attempt to kind of come up with answers for people's life. But uh, they might talk about God and humanity and redemption, you know, about the importance of being a, a believer in Christ and how without him we're fallen in our sin, we're bound by sin. But when it comes to, you know, dealing with the spiritual aspect of it, the one we're talking about in regard to this series, they exclude the activities of demons. The reality of Satan. We, we just, you know, that's, that's, that, that's that excluded middle, as you might want to call it. There, there's the Eastern worldview that he talked about in his particular book on bondage breakers. And these people live and operate believing that spiritual forces are just an everyday reality, all right, just in the Eastern world. And it's not just in the Eastern world, there's elements of that in our, in our culture in, in America as well, but it's kind of consigned to Eastern thought where we seek to appease these forces or these gods, multiple gods perhaps with uh, religious rituals from everything from incense to candles to whatever it might be to kind of ward off the evil spirits. I remember when I lived in New Mexico and I lived in the northern corner up in Farmington, worked for the Sears company there and we'd go out to the Navajo reservation out there and there were, you'd see a lot of this in the culture there amongst the Native Americans with using different colors on the external parts of their house so as to ward off the evil spirits and things that would be allowed in the home or not allowed in the home because we didn't want these these unnatural forces infecting or affecting our lives in a in a negative way but that's that's an element you know in, in that eastern worldview where it, it, it deals a lot with the, the superstitious things and doesn't properly identify the truth now the guy named Dr. Paul Ebert who talks about between those two worldviews, the Eastern worldview and the Western worldview, there's this what's called the, the excluded middle. And the excluded medical middle would be where that kingdom of darkness. As Christians, if we're going to have a balanced theology and a balanced spiritual life, then we're going to have to understand to some degree this, what he calls the excluded middle. By the way, there is no excluded middle because Satan's active. And as Hal Lindsey wrote many years ago, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. The, the, the demons are real in our lives and their, their activity is real in our lives. And they do roam about like roaring lions seeking someone to devour. As the apostle said, they we're not ignorant of his devices, that there are fiery darts that need to be warded off from the enemy. So we need to understand these truths. A good example of, of this in, in Christian mindset many times is, is the issue of illness. Some illnesses, according to the Bible, which is our worldview it, it comes from, I believe that many illnesses, not all of them, and maybe not even the major part of them, but some illnesses are a direct relationship to the kingdom of darkness, to the demonic, and to sin. In fact, the Bible talks about it in, in, in a couple of ways. In, in many ways, Paul wrote the church at Corinth. In fact, every time we do the Lord's Supper, we kind of share out of that, that message to the church at Corinth about the, the Lord's Supper and how important it is and everything that it represents in the, in the kingdom of God and for us as the people of God and how it stands for the cross and the blood of Christ. And Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In other words, he said, you approach the table, that, the, the, the Lord's Supper with pure hearts, with your sin confessed, with your heart right, because it represents everything Jesus did to die for our sins so that our hearts could be right. So the problem comes, this is what he told the Corinthians, which is applicable to us. The problem comes when we take the Lord's Supper, which represents removal of sin, but we take it with sin in our life. How we dishonor the Lord. How we dishonor the sacred. He said, because you're doing this with rebellion in your heart, he says, some of you are sick. And some of you have even 
died. Why, why is this sickness? He said, because Satan has had a hand in your life. Through your rebellion and your disobedience, you opened the door to the enemy. And he's come in and he's, he, he wreaked havoc in your life to the point where you're becoming sick and ill and some have even died. Now, we don't much think about it in the context of our spiritual walk in life. I mean, kind of, with the absence of the teaching about it, many people kind of feel that, well, that spiritual world exists, but it really doesn't impinge upon what we're doing here or the natural world. It's kind of out there, as we said, it's more that transcendent world. And so when you exclude the supernatural and reality of demons and even the power of God, and you consign everything to that kind of upper tier of the, the transcendental, then you kind of live with those things are real, but they don't have an effect upon my life. And that's to live in ignorance. And that kind of ignorance will definitely cause bondage in your life. Jesus said it's knowing the truth, not ignorance, that sets us free. So we don't want to exclude those elements, but at the same time, we don't want to exclude the power of God or the reality of God's presence to impact our lives for his glory. When you look at the Bible in, in regard to even sicknesses, for example, uh, one-fourth of the healings in the New Testament that Jesus did in the lives of sick people, one-fourth of those healings were actually deliverances from demonic forces. One-fourth. Now, I don't know if that means that one-fourth of all sickness, let's not take it that far. But the idea is that there are some illnesses that are due uh, to, to demons and that we need to be delivered from those things. The man whom Jesus dealt with in Luke 13 and other passions in Luke were like the woman. She'd had it for many years. One man said he'd been, he'd been bound by that demon for, for 18 years in one case. All these physical problems were a result of spiritual issues in their lives. Physical problems resulted from the spiritual failures in their life. And so you can't exclude this from your, from your thinking about, you know, your relationship to the spiritual world. Any of you who've done any counseling with people, sometimes you, you, you've seen what I'm talking about in regard to, to, to people you deal with it's with constant headaches and dizziness and general pain throughout the body. cannot even be identified. Many times it's just a result of a demonic influence upon their life. Not all, so don't go walk out there, Brother Joe says. I remember reading a book called Christians and Demon Possession by a man named Fred Dickerson, who is an authority in this area, I believe, tells us about a client with MS symptoms as a result of being demonized. Muscul muscular sclerosis is a result of demonization. And he does say in the book, not every case is like that. Most like, probably aren't, but some are. And so we ought to give some attention to what the Bible's teaching. When it talks about demon possession and Christians, there's a thin line that people don't understand. That possession is a word in, in scripture, which is really two words in the original language of scripture. It's usually possessed of a spirit or spirit possessed. You know, it basically means that a demon is controlling some aspect of a life. So that's really not even a good term. In other words, lost people obviously controlled by the enemy, right? They're, they're bound in their sin. They're bound by Satan. But as Christians, we can give up areas in our life. And Paul warned against letting strongholds be established in our lives. What's a stronghold? It's a place in your life where the enemy gets control. And it really gets down to this. He's controlling the way you perceive life. The way you look at the world, the way you look at God, Satan gets control and it can come through bitterness, it can come through actions of disobedience in your life, but you just, you look at everything wrong. You don't have a proper perspective. Paul said that's why we destroy these speculations, these high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. In other words, are there ways that I'm thinking that are contrary to God's will in regard to how I ought to be thinking? How do you look at life? How do you look at your children? How do you look at your spouse? How do you look at your job? All these things we need to learn to look at the way God leads us and tells us and directs us to look at. Because if not, our thinking is altered. That is Satan's favorite battleground is our mind. I know some people, they're just, they just, I mean, it's the ultimate in cynicism. You say, well, that's me, you know? Not only is the glass half empty, it's dirty. You know, that kind of mindset. Everything's cynical. And what's, what's happened, you've, you've allowed Satan to skew, skew your perception of the world, yourself, God's will, His purposes. I mean, it's, just, it's like, you know, the, the old song, looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. You, it's not the, you're not seeing the real light fracture of things and how things, how things really are. It's, it's a deluded perception of things. Jesus, you know, in John 17, that high priestly prayer is praying to the Father. Not to take us out of the world, but to keep us holy and set apart in the world that we're living in. 
and to realize that we're going to have to do battle with the enemy. So we need to realize the present day reality, whether it's the Western or Eastern. Hey, the present truth is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole or the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Who's this to? You, to me. Satan has a scheme. Satan has a strategy. Satan is moving and working against our lives. And so, so you, don't be afraid. Don't run and hide. Get ready for war. Put on the armor. We're not about running to hiding places. We're about standing firm. Put on the whole armor of God. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. He says, you're fighting in a war zone. You don't want to be taken prisoner of war, then you better put your clothes on. Your fighting clothes on. You put your armor on. The reality is not some transcendent thing that doesn't impinge upon our life or, or affect our lives. The reality is there is a spiritual world out there that real, that is real and will affect our lives. Now, on the other hand, you have the world who doesn't comprehend it all. In fact, there's this, this popular movement of, of being spiritual. You can watch the talk shows and the talking heads, especially when they get the celebrities on and they like to tell you how spiritual they are. But it's a spiritual reality without Christ at the head of it. It's a spiritual reality without Jesus as Lord in their lives. In fact, over the last several years, it, it, we've begun to sense there's, people have begun to, to feel, I believe, that there's, there's more to life than meets the eye. There's more to life than science has revealed. There's more to life than I, than I can deal with in my senses or my senses have experienced. The truth of the matter is they're right. And the only way to safety, security, salvation, peace, fullness, and life is through the way that Jesus gives us. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end of it is destruction. Jesus clearly defines the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So the way to experience fullness of life is through Jesus. The world, on the other hand, is turning into to the New Age things and the Eastern religions and the occult and ritual things and holistic health and mysticism and all these other popular things that are happening in the culture. I'm spiritual, see, because I have this certain belief system I've adopted. So we don't want to go that route either. Say, so then what is, you know, what is the center of that worldview, Eastern view, whatever it is that's, that excludes God? Well, the center of that whole worldview and secular worldview, if you want to just call it, is self. I'm experiencing with these spiritual things because I want to know how it will benefit me. What can I get out of this? How is this going to meet my need? I want to, to do my own thing, but I want to do it where I, I have more, where I succeed, where I, where I can accumulate. I, I want a happier self. I want a happier me. I want a better me. I, I want a better life. And it, it's, it's, it's pride bent on self-ambition to somehow, through its own means and efforts, to satisfy and find the fullness of life. It doesn't come that way. There is no life in reality and fullness without Jesus Christ. Now, this is popular, all right? Go through any bookstore. Go to Barnes & Nobles. I mean, look on your iPad or whatever. Pull up the bookstores. It's all about being a better you, how to succeed, how to achieve, how to, how to be richer, how to be better, how to be better than everybody else. The happier you. And that's even, you know, go to the Christian bookstore. It's there as well. A lot of Christian authors writing how to, how to have a better you, a better life, more of you. You know, how, how to be the top shelf, how, how to succeed, how to be better, you know. It's, but it all gets down to the same thing. So much of this has been on doing my own thing, my own way, and how can I add some spiritual element to make me better? And it becomes you. Uh, Peter is a, is a glaring example of this, this struggle between self and the Christ-centered view and, and Christ-centered living and the Jesus perspective of things. You remember when Jesus is there and the Lord's asking, you know, whom do men say that I am? And he says, well, Lord, you know, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, to help Peter out, Jesus said, you didn't figure that out. This is Joram's translation, because you're so smart. My father in heaven revealed that to you. That's what he told him. And it's important to realize when we have some stroke of brilliance, it really comes from the father. <laughs> Amen. 
Uh, I had one of those strokes of brilliance at one point in my life. I thought it was me at first, but it went something like this. You've really screwed your life up. And there's different translations for that. I'm sure that made me more sense to you. Now that wasn't because I was so smart one day and figured I'd really mess my life up. That's the Holy Spirit of God bringing conviction and that spiritual world of righteousness and light and life was moving in my direction and bringing me to Jesus and the, the lights were coming on. You messed up your life. You, you, as, as long as you're God, you're messing up. So that's where it starts. And for Peter, it was this moment where the Lord says to him, you know, uh, hey, heaven and earth has revealed this to you. My father in heaven's revealed. I mean, heaven, my father in heaven's revealed this to you. It wasn't, wasn't by self-revelation. And so he commends him at that point. Great moment in Peter's life. I'm sure he, he's happy. And then till later, the Lord goes on this same context and he said, listen, guys, uh, the end is here. We're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things by the religious leaders. I'm going to give my life. And he, he tells them what's coming forward. Well, then it says, then Peter took the Lord aside in, in, in the book of Matthew. And it says in, in verse 23 of this chapter, chapter 16, it says, uh, and Peter took the Lord aside and began to rebuke him saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Sounds like another great moment for Peter until Jesus turns to Peter and responds, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Yes. Now, one thing you discover about Jesus as you read the New Testament, he was constantly intent on the Father's will. He was born to do his Father's will. He can't, even in the, even in the temple at the age of 12, I, you knew I must be about my Father's will. Even to the garden, those last earthly days in his physical, you know, prior to the death of the cross, he's there at Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done. And here comes Peter speaking out, hey, 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 the Father's will is not important. What well, you're important. How many people do all the time say, well, you know, I know what God says, but I need to be happy. Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't, you're not interested in the things of God. You're not setting your mind. I mean, Jesus rebuked him, seems kind of merciless in the moment. Get tea behind me, Satan. Severe, amen? But what's Peter doing? Here's the advice, basically. Save yourself at all cost. Don't give up yourself. Sacrifice, I know there's a duty, but sacrifice duty for self-interest. It, it, it was an appeal to Christ to his personal convenience. His personal safety. But in reality, his advice was a, a satanic principle because Satan's aim is always to promote self-interest above all things else as the chief end of man. You, you're the most important thing. And that's where we miss it all. Satan is referred to as the prince and power of the air. His, his little kingdom is over the, the old kingdom of self. Trying to, you know, motivate you to reject the will of God, the purposes of God, the plan of God, to get you to direct your own life. He's called the accuser of the brethren. He hates you. He wants you subservient to his will. He doesn't believe that even as a child of God that your interest could be anything other than self-interest. But through the power of the Christ, all those things change. You can almost hear the devil hissing, can't you? All men are selfish. Everybody has a price and they'll sell their soul. And he's deceived a lot of people into thinking that they're really serving themselves when in fact they're serving the world, the flesh, and the devil according to what the scripture teaches. The Christian has a different center. The Christian has a, a different point where we, we live from. Jesus confronts this humanist self-serving grid and offers a new grid from which we stand and view life from. And it's, it's ultimately, it's the cross of Jesus Christ. Satan comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. That's his end game. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life. But where do we find this life? Better life. The real life, through Christ. What's the proper Christian worldview? We'll call it the, the view from the cross. And we'll, we'll, I want to wrap up with these six basic points, which are the most important things. If, if you're having areas of struggle in your life that you can't find freedom in, maybe it's addictions, maybe it's bad habits, whatever you want to call it, continued failures and sin in your life, some stronghold that you have yet to overcome, 
If you don't deal with this first link in the chain and it's broken, then the rest will never be broken. And this is why so many people struggle because they won't deal with this number one link, if we want to call it that, in the chain of bondage in their life. Remember, there is a biblical perspective to living our lives and it's not good enough just to be informed. We want to be transformed by those truths. Now, remember, if we go back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3, the, the temptation to Adam and to Eve was this. You can be like God. Self-determination. You don't need anybody else. You don't need anyone else, which is the essence of all self-centered, secular worldview that Satan promotes today. You, 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 can, you can be in charge of your own life. How many people feel that way? I don't, nobody tell me what to do. I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. You know, I, government's not going to tell me what to do. People aren't going to tell me what to do. Mama going to tell me what to do. Daddy not going to tell me what to do. You know, my boss ain't going to tell me what to do. I just quit. My wife, my husband, he ain't going to tell me what to do. I just leave. I'm going to do my thing. That's the very core of what Satan's promoting. And so many people are believed, are, sed, are seduced into believing the lie that if they just do their thing, which is really not even their thing, that they'll be happy. The essence of the New Age movement is found in that. Let me catch this carefully. Creation in Genesis 1 establishes very clearly there is one creator and there is one God and you are not it. Nor am I. Nor was Adam and nor was Eve. They were not gods. We are created beings. We cannot exist in fullness and, full, and, and fruitfulness in life apart from God. Let me say it clearly. It is never in the mind of God for you to have life apart from him. He created Adam and Eve, thus all of us, that we might know him and enjoy him and live with him fully and freely for eternity. Overcome sin and death and hell and all that Satan stood for. Now, when Adam was, had the breath of life poured into him, he became alive and he was fully alive. Not only physically alive like you and I, but he had something else that we don't have at our birth. He had spiritual life. He knew God. He had fullness of life. And Satan's doing everything he can to pervert that and to subvert the will of God for his life. There's a tree that God places in the garden. God says, don't eat this. The day you do, you'll die. Satan's first goal is to come and sell Adam the idea, hey, God's trying to hold something out on you. Some of y'all still believe in that lie. Some of you think if you get right with God, you're not you're gonna have any fun anymore. You can't make any more money. You're going, to have to, you're going to do things you don't want to do. And you still believe in the lie. And you haven't learned anything from anybody else's failures. So here's Adam. He eats. And what happens? He dies in that moment, not physically, but spiritually. Now he has sinned. He's separated from God, ultimately resulting in his expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And ever since that moment in time, every person who's ever been born of the seed of Adam, all of humanity, was born into sin. They are physically alive, but just as Adam became spiritually dead, we are spiritually dead. How do you know you're spiritually dead? Your life centers around yourself. You become your own little God. It's around you now, your pride, your self-exaltation, your independence. What I want, my will, my way. And that is the frame of reference from which Peter spoke to Jesus. Never be, God forbid, that you should die. The idea that man is his own God is the center of all satanic-inspired secularist worldviews, no matter east or west. It is the primary link in the chain of bondage for every one of us that must be broken. The problem with man's attempt at being like God without God shows that he's trying to occupy a role that God never intended for his life. Let me say this again. God never intended when you were born, when man was created, for you to live independent from him. You were designed, you were created for a relationship, a unique walk to know God. You lack the necessary attributes to run your own life. May I say that again? You lack the necessary attributes to make decisions to run your own life. God made you to know him, to rely upon him, to have him. But even whether it's New Age movements or Mormonism or whatever it might be, oh, you can be like God. Those are all lies born of Satan himself. 
contrary to new age and popular, uh, popular opinion, the potential to be God has never been in you. It never was in Adam, nor will it ever be. Why? Because only God is capable of being God. God tells us in the scripture, there is no other God but me. There were none before me. And catch this, my dear Mormon friends, there will not be any after me. <laughs> one God, one Lord, one hope, one faith, one baptism. There's answers in Christ. So if you desire freedom, real freedom in your life from bondage to whatever it might be that is shackling your life, the world, the flesh, the devil, this link of you being in control must be broken and smashed and destroyed or you'll never be free. Now I said, I'm gonna give you six quick points you better write fast, all right? Proper Christian worldview is found in Matthew 16. This follows the incident with Peter. You're the greatest, you're the king, you're the Lord, you're the son of God, and don't do that to yourself. <laughs> Jesus is straightening out their perspective here. This is all in context. And Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Powerful words. But listen to what he goes on to say. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And those men all saw that resurrection glory, that first stage of Jesus coming in glory with his resurrection and ascension at the right hand of God, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are six truths, if you can capture this morning, principles from the Word of God that will help you It'll help you constitute a biblical, proper worldview of your life, your decisions, your choices in the world around you, your family. They're foundational guidelines for anybody that wants to walk in freedom in Christ. So if there's areas you're constantly struggling at, and it may be in your marriage, it may be in your finances, it may be in your morality, it may be in your habits, whatever it is, listen carefully. Jesus says, first step here, deny yourself. Now this is not the same as self-denial. All right? Every businessman knows that you've got to have some self-denial to get successful. Every athlete knows you're going to have to have some processes of self-denial if you're going to be successful. Every musician knows it's going to take practice and practice and, you know, forsaking things if you're going to be good at your craft. It, it's a pretty well understood principle. If you want to win the gold, if you want to win the prize, if you, if you want to reach the top of the heap, there's some elements of sacrifice that take place in self-denial. But this is not what Jesus is talking about. It goes much deeper than that, than, than, than you making a few things you're going to give up so you can get a good grade, all right? It deals with the struggle of who is going to rule on the throne of your life. Who's going to be in charge of your heart? It gets down to this. Who's going to be God over you? It can't be you. You have to give up that position. Uh, there's nothing wrong with succeeding. There's nothing wrong with ambitions. I mean, there's godly ambitions. There's things that God wants you to achieve in life. But he's dealing with this issue, who's in charge? Who's in charge? We're out here and we're just struggling. Well, I just want Jesus to be in charge. Jesus is not struggling over that. He's already entered the battle, by the way. Amen. And won. He's waiting for you to decide. Well, I feel God pulling this way. The devil like it's some kind of eternal tug of war between God and the devil. No, it's what are you going to do? What, what choice will you make? Quit blaming God and quit blaming the world and quit blaming the devil. I mean, realize, hey, you can't do this on your own. You need God. Let me say this for the third or fourth time. You were not designed to function independent from God. So you might as well give up. <laughs> You're just wasting your time in a struggle that you will not win. Your soul was not designed by God to function in the master position. He is. So, step one, deny yourself. Step two, pick up your cross daily. All right? Now, this is not our cross, the way people think. It's his cross. Pick up his cross daily. It's that, it has to do with that, that identify, identification with Christ and being 
who God's called to be. Galatians 2 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but yet not I, but Christ now lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the power of the Son of God, you know, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's, it's a faith choice in my life today that now I've given up control. Now, now I'm going to embrace this life. I'm going to embrace Christ. I, I'm going to surrender to his will. It's good to know first and foremost that when I come to Christ and deny myself, that forgiveness of sins is found. But it's embracing the cross of Jesus Christ that I find not just forgiveness of sin, I find freedom from those things that held me in captivity. And I think it just basically means it's a daily acknowledgement that I belong to God. It's a daily acknowledgement that I was not purchased with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It's a daily acknowledgement, I belong to Jesus. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm here to glorify God, that my life is gonna be found in Jesus Christ. And now no longer am I, it's not a pursuit now of what I want to do and doing my thing and in order to kind of please God at some point in my life, but it's now to quit trying to be something or do something and say, hey, God, you're in charge, I'll follow you today. I, I think some of you, starting to discover that to live the Christian life is an absolute impossibility without Christ. I mean, we sat at a railroad crossing the other day with Alan and some guys, and the train sat there for 30 minutes. I was going fishing. I didn't have time for this. My son, I said, there ought to be a law against this. <laughs> I had some selfish ambitions. I want to go fishing, not sitting in front of a railroad track. That's what I told Joseph. Why don't you get out and move that train? That's the way people look at Christian life, though, you know. They think they can move the train. You think that you can do something for God on your own strength. For you to live the Christian life without Christ and without God empowering your life is for you to say, hey, I'm going to move that train about five cars out of the way. And you're going to get out, and by your own energy and your own effort, you're going to put your shoulder into it, and you're going to grunt and groan, you're going to get that train. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen until the engineer decides to pull back on that throttle and move the train. The power's up in the engineer's booth there. The power of God is available to us only as we're in Christ. And for us to try to do something for God by our own energy, well, ask Moses how that worked. He ended up killing one Egyptian. There were millions. I mean, it's going to take a long time to free the people of Israel from the Egyptian bondage, killing one, one Egyptian at a time. That's the way Christians live their life. Here's the beauty of it. You have God. But now it's just pointed, hey, I'm going to take him up daily. And the third element is I'm going to follow Christ. So I'm not seeking to overcome myself by self-effort. That's a hopeless struggle. I'm pursuing Jesus. Let me put it this way. Self will never cast out self any more than Satan will cast out Satan. This is not going to happen. An independent, self-motivated person, motivated by their flesh, you know, still wants to be like God. It's a matter of now, am I going to allow the Holy Spirit to work in my life? Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we who live are constantly, we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? That the life of Jesus can be manifest in our mortal flesh. You say, well, that sounds like a dismal path. I assure you, it is not. To lay yourself there at the cross daily and turn from that and say, I'm going to follow Jesus today. That is a glorious and tremendous experience of living life to its fullest. Yeah, there may be failures along your way, but you continue to follow. We're led by the Spirit. Even when it results in painful experiences, you know, hey, we still have our sonship in Christ. We're still born again. We're still children of God. Listen carefully. We were not designed to function independently of God. I think that's six times now. <laughs> Let's see if we can get it before the service is over. God never built you that way. We must be dependent upon it. Our intent is on following Christ. And as we do that, we discover the grace, the power, the glory of God that we need. That's when we begin to prove what is acceptable and good and perfect will is. We're presenting our body, that living sacrifice to serve God. Follow Christ. The, third, the, the fourth element here, he says, he talks about how, are you going to lose your soul just to gain something? No, we sacrifice this lower life to gain the higher life. So what do you mean? If you want to save your natural life, all right, and find your sense of life or your sense of self-worth in, in positions, in titles, possessions, accomplishments, 
and seek worldly wealth. You may find it for some short period of time, but it's not the higher life. If that's what life means to you, ultimately Jesus says you'll lose it. At best, should you accomplish, at best you can only hold it for this lifetime and lose everything for eternity. You've heard it before, there's no hearse in the funeral. I mean, there's no, there's no U-Hauls behind the hearse in the funerals. You're not gonna take it with you. Jesus said, somebody else is gonna spend your stuff. Joram's translation. In first Peter, I mean, excuse me, Paul's talking to Timothy and he first, in first Timothy chapter four, verse eight, he said, listen, bodily exercise profits little, but rather exercise yourself unto godliness because he goes on to say, for such things, you know, hold a promise of life, not only present, but eternal life, things to come. There's more than meets the eye to this life. So be willing to sacrifice a lower life to realize there's an eternity out there that's a higher life and I want to experience in fullness. The fifth thing is, I think for this lesson is to sacrifice the pleasure of things to gain the pleasure of life. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What's so important? What kind of pleasures? I mean, what, what, would, it, what, what, what would you exchange for? Let me bring it into Christians here just for a minute, to, to, to Believer's Fellowship, to our church. Let me ask any Christian in here, what would you take in exchange, say for the fruit of the Spirit? What would you exchange, what would you take in exchange for the life of peace, joy, love, patience, all those things that God gives us in Christ, what would you exchange for that as a Christian? You say, well, bless God, nothing. And we all know the right answer, all right? We all know the right answer. But let's, let's relate it, you know, to the day-to-day -day practice and let's answer it there. You say, how do you do that? Where, where do we spend our time? How do we invest our time? How do we invest our talents, our, our gifts, our energy, our money, our, our you know, uh, is, are we just investing things that are not going to last? Or do we have some eternal investments as well? We realize the importance of, you know, that, that it's, 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 it's we, I mean, you can only have so much house, so much car, so much stuff. And the people who keep accumulating, 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 they're some of the most miserable people in the world. Because their, their science of life, so to say, is revolved around stuff. All to end, the chief end of fallen humanity is to be happy as, as animals instead of experiencing life as a child of God. The, the, the human animals kind of, I just want to be happy, and they're doing everything they can to find happiness. Our aim is to, I want to be a God's child. God never created me to live independently of Him. God has a better plan for you. The sixth and the last is this, that we would sacrifice the temporal to gain the eternal. One of the greatest signs of spiritual maturity is the ability to postpone rewards. We're living in that instant generation, you know, uh, where, where some of you as adults spent most of your adult life getting to the place where you are financially, the house you have, the, the vehicles you drive, the things that are in your home. You spend a lifetime working where your kids just want to go out and get a credit card and charge it all for 12 easy payments. And then they end up with 1,200 12 easy payments. And nothing's easy anymore, and they're in bondage, and their lives are miserable, and their families are torn apart. It's a constant source of arguments because they don't know how to sacrifice or how to postpone I, I preached a few weeks ago on, on making hard decisions on Wednesday nights. And no, you weren't here. And no, I'm not going to preach it again. You get to get the tape. Next time, show up. <laughs> but I used the illustration out of Hebrews chapter 11. It says Moses chose. Listen to these words. It's just ridiculous. It's stupid from, from a human perspective. Moses chose rather to suffer with the children of Israel than to enjoy the pleasures, excuse me, what's wrong with Moses? What most people say, he chose to suffer than to enjoy. That's number one. If we're, if we're in the, the natural decision process for us, that just clears it right there. No suffering and joy. It must be God's will because God wants me happy, right? Yeah, well, why don't you take some time and ask God what he wants? We don't do that. We just weigh it out by what's before us. Uh, let's see, enjoyment, suffering, enjoyment, suffering, oh, enjoyment. Easy, hard, easy, hard, easy. Oh, easy. 
Lots of time, little time, lots of time, inside, instant. That's the approach. And Jesus said, if you're going to live for me, it's not the way it's going to be. You have to realize there's a longer term deal here, and it's so long, it's called eternity. You have to sacrifice the, etern the, the temporal, the things that are going to not last to, to gain the eternal. In other words, far better to know that we are God's children than gain anything that the world has calls valuable. I mean, the greatest pleasure of all is to know that you belong to God. Satan's ultimate lies that, hey, you're capable of being God of your own life, and you're not. The ultimate bondage for any Christian, especially believers, is that you, you think that, that you can live your life by making your own decisions and usurp God's will and usurp God's authority for your life, and you're wrong. And that's where you need to back up just for a moment. See, how much of your life has been entrenched in demonic thinking? Save yourself. Put yourself first. Instead of saying, God, what's your will? God, what do you want me to do in this situation? God, what's your plan for my family? Not what's my plan. God, what's your plan for my finances? What's, what's your plan for my life? What's your plan for my children? What's, what's your purpose in, 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 in my job? And sometimes it results in hardship. But as Moses said, he considered, he considered the suffering far better than the temporal, easy path to take. Because he looked beyond the moment and he looked at eternity where things really pay off. You'd rather be living in the light of God's grace than enjoying the pleasures of sin which are only temporary for a season and live with regrets the rest of your life. Satan's goal keep you in bondage. How does he do that? He wants you to usurp the authority of God in your life. And when you focus on yourself, and when you focus on what's easy, and what's just temporal, or what's material, Satan wins that, wins that fight. You lose all the way around. Deny yourself. Take up the cross and follow me. Don't forfeit eternity for the temporal. Don't give up the grace, the blessings, the peace, the power of God for something that's not going to satisfy you in the long run. And every one of us, if we'll be honest, have done that at different times in our life. Have we learned the lesson? Is Jesus really lording, ruling, sitting on the throne of our life? Or we just say he's there, but we're trying to co-pilot. It doesn't work that way. Amen? Is there anything in your life that you would forfeit all your blessings, the grace of God for your life? Anything going on right now that you've substituted your will for God's will? And I would encourage you today to lay those things down and throne Jesus Christ. The Bible says sanctify Jesus Christ as Lord. What does that mean? Set him apart in your life as the God over all things that are going on. Jesus, Lord, my life. He's Lord of my marriage. He's Lord of my parenting. He's Lord of my family. He's Lord of my relationship with my parents. He's Lord over my wallet. He's Lord over my time. He's Lord over my attitudes. I'm not going to wake up and just say, oh, I don't feel good today, so I'm going to be mad. No, 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 he's Lord over attitudes now. I can't wake up on Sunday and say, I don't know if I'm going to go to church today. I don't have, I don't have decision. He's Lord. Huh? Yeah, okay, God. Well, I don't want to forgive them. You don't know what they do. He's Lord. He'll forgive them. You want to be free? I do. And I believe you do as well. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, in the name of Jesus. Sunday, we're going through this Sunday as well. And Amen. Father, the Lord. And uh, Eric Hackett is coming this uh, morning to uh, let his profession of faith be made public in baptism. And so, uh, Eric, do you have something you want to share what the Lord's done? People who know me well know that I can be stubborn at times. And uh, today's service kind of touched on this a bit. Uh, I've been coming here for about a year now, and I've listened to Pastor Joe and Pastor Tim talk about the people who think that they've got it all figured out and that they don't need God in their lives. And to be honest, I was that person. And recently, I come into some of the hardest times in my life that I've ever had to deal with. And it's hard. As that is, and as bad as that is, it led to something really great. 
I've come to realize that I do need help and I do need God and that's why I'm up here today. I'm happy to say that I'm ready. I'm ready to put pride to the side, take this step forward and get right with him. And it starts today. And Eric, we're happy for you. We're praising the Lord with you. And we're just looking forward to all the great things God's going to do. Amen. Eric, upon your profession of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, it's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Woo! That's good. Amen. Praise God and the Lamb for what God's doing in our midst. His Spirit is moving mightily. Just a few closing announcements as we wrap up. First of all, there is no evening. There are no evening services tonight as we have the uh, holiday weekend still continuing.